So we begin, a, as I mentioned, a sermon series called Walking with God, where we're going to be looking at uh, a number of stories, texts that demonstrate how we should do that, why we should do that, walk with God in, in the journey of our Christian life. We're going to start with a very familiar story for some of us, the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Before we read the story, we need some background. Daniel was a prophet who lived in the last recorded days of the Jewish people. Jehoiakim was one of the last kings of Judah. And then in chapters 1, verses 1 through 4, the great king Nebuchadnezzar took over Jehoiakim and the Jewish people, and he carefully selected the brightest young men of the royal family to be trained. In those days, it was essentially to be brainwashed or their version of being discipled in the language and the literature of the Babylonians, and they would be employed to serve in the king's palace. And in 605 BC, Daniel is one of these bright stars who is taken captive into Babylon, and he is especially wise and gifted by God. The first chapter records how Daniel and his friends are trained, they're prepared for service uh, for the king, and then chapters 2 through 5, there are a few stories that often revolve around these men and their struggles related to living in this idol-worshiping country. Our story begins at chapter 6, <clears throat> beginning of verse 1, and now there's a new king, Darius, and we begin reading at verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. <clears throat> now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And so at this point it means that Daniel is disobeying the new command that had been set up as a trap for Daniel. And so the other government officials complained to the king the king doesn't want any harm to come to Daniel, but he has to obey his command. And so now look at verse 16. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lord's that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. 
my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I have found, was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him. Because why? He had trusted in his God. And then we know in verse 24 that all those who had maliciously accused Daniel and their families were thrown into the lion's den, horrifically killed. The text says that the lions broke all their bones into pieces. Now, throughout Scripture, you will find <clears throat> that believers have a dual citizenship. We are citizens of the land in which we're living and citizens of the kingdom of God. And as citizens of the kingdom of God, we are to be different. We are to be set apart, holy. The values, the laws, the demands of God's kingdom must always trump any of the other values, laws, and demands. Perhaps you've heard it say that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus repeatedly confronted the Pharisees and religious leaders because for them, what they were was not in the world and didn't care about the world. On the other hand, Jesus had also engaged with, made progress with, sinners who were in the world and of the world. And Jesus would offer salvation to them, and then he would say, go and sin no more. Be holy, be different. The Apostle Paul said it this way, do not be conformed to this world. And this is what we're seeing in the story of Daniel. But it's not just about being in the world. Daniel and his friends have been placed by God in a unique position so that they could be a blessing to their captors and build up the society in which they found themselves. Even though this is evil society. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to these same people who were slaves and exiles in this foreign land of Babylon with these words. In Jeremiah 29, he said, build houses, plant gardens, eat their produce. So in other words, go ahead, have families here, get well settled into the land. And then he said, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. So another way to think about it was what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, we are salt. And in those days, salt was used to make food taste better. Much more importantly, it was pressed into things like meat in order to preserve it, and salt was pressed into things that would otherwise deteriorate or spoil. And so the idea is that we're called to go into the places where things are falling apart in order to preserve and make them better. We are to be in the world and build it up. We are to pray and work toward making the community where you live better. We are to be engaged in it very much. And this is what our vision is all about as well. This is why this comes up on the screen from time to time to remind us this is where we're going to have an impact on our community. Now, at the same time, our story demonstrates this. How can you effectively not be of the world? How can you be courageously different even when there's pressure to conform? So first of all, let's think about the vital importance of courage here today because this is a huge part of this text. Winston Churchill, good theology always, he said this, courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees all others. And indeed, as you look at this story and as you look throughout Scripture, you might say that Courage is foundational for our, our obedience to God. And yet at the same time, we live in a culture where courage is horribly receding as a valued virtue. Last summer, the Financial Times published an article by Jemima Kelly, and this is what she said. 
society seems to be suffering from a crisis of courage. Virtue signaling might be endemic, but courage, like honor, is not deemed a virtue worth signaling. Indeed, all the incentives are stacked on the opposite side. There is little to lose from going along with what everyone is saying, even if you don't believe it yourself, and much to gain from proving that you are on the right side. Courage, sticking your head above the parapet and saying what you really think, can conversely get you into a huge amount of trouble, and usually you are not rewarded for it. She also notes in the article on how if you Google through um, <clears throat> articles and, and everything uh, that is available in the past couple of decades, the words <clears throat> courage, bravery, and fortitude have dramatically fallen off in use. Nobody cares about those things anymore. And finally she wrote, if we want our societies to thrive, we must be courageous enough to think for ourselves and stand up for what we believe in. And then at the same time in our culture today, we are facing intense pressure to conform. We know that. To be a people with absolutely no judgment. How can you judge, right? Russell Moore has written a book entitled The Courage to Stand, Facing Your Fear Without Losing Your Soul, which is very much then about this topic. And this is what he said. It, is, it simply is not true that we live in a time without judgment. No matter how we may want to view ourselves, our age has replaced the judgment seat of Christ with nothing but a countless number of little judgment seats. Not only this, but the ultimate penalty of those judgment seats is the dispensing of shame and exile. Whether in a middle school cafeteria, or in a theological seminary faculty lounge, or in a nursing home game room, the ultimate pu punishment is to be told, you are not one of us, go away. That is shame. And the fear of that kind of shame leads people to hide themselves in whatever crowd they need in order to belong. This happens in our schools. Kids are under pressure to go along with the crowd, to blend in if they don't think and act in the way that the crowd wants them to. Students in colleges and universities are pressured to write and affirm things that are contrary to God's word. Some years ago, I had a friend who had been told by his boss to cheat on the company books in order to avoid taxes. As well, another example comes from our own life when our family lived in the Parsonage, Northeast Grand Rapids, urban area for 20 years. I and many of our church family members who lived in that area faced all kinds of resistance and evil. Ruth and I had a drug-related murder in our backyard. It was an execution. I was attacked by a man with a crowbar. Many of us suffered through shots in the middle of the night and homes that were being repeatedly burglarized. And through those years, I had pastor friends, I had family members. They urged us, you need to get out of there. And indeed, the natural instinct is to relocate and move to a safe place. But here's what we learn from God's word. I had to remind myself, I had to say it over and over. This is what we are here for. Not to run away and let the mess get worse, but to run toward the struggle and make it better. God would have us be in the world or in the community working and praying toward his peace and prosperity and at the same time be courageously different from our world and our community. Christian courage, you might think about it this way, as the willingness to say and do the right thing regardless of the cost. Proverbs 28, verse 1, it says, The wicked flee, but the righteous are bold as a lion. So think about this. In light of what we've said up to this point, and we'll think about this more as we go, but are you courageous and bold moving toward neighbors and into the community? Or might you be more characterized by locking yourself up into your house and retreating from your community? Are you radically different in your workplace, or are you blending in? Do you stand up and work against the laws of the land that are in conflict 
with God's laws. And our story shows us how we can be radically courageous. And the first way to be radically courageous is that we need this daily fellowship in walking with God. An irreversible <clears throat> decree has been signed into law. Anyone who prays to any god or man other than King Darius must be killed, den of lions. Verse 10, immediately Daniel does his usual prayer three times a day on his knees, just as, he, as he'd been doing since he was young. And it's helpful to understand it's not because he's obeying some laws to that effect. He's not just going through the motions, I need to do this. It was Daniel's fellowship with God. He's giving thanks, like a son who delights in being with his father. He's looking outside of himself to find the strength he needs by just being with God. In verse 11, it says that Daniel made a plea to God, Lord, I need you to carry me through. And, and throughout these first six chapters of Daniel, Daniel and his friends had revealed this same kind of commitment and this fellowship with God over and over. And so here's what we see. We see humble prayer and fellowship with God. It is God's ordained means by which we receive the grace, the courage, and the strength to carry us through whatever comes our way. There's a number of occasions in the Gospels where it is said that Jesus himself found strength for his bold obedience by regularly going off to meet with his Father in fellowship and in prayer. There's a great story in Acts 3 and 4. I love this text. Peter and John boldly preached the Gospel to a large crowd that included religious leaders who had already hated them, who had already put them in prison. And this is the same Peter, if you remember, who had earlier been a sniveling, denying wimp, declining, de denying Jesus three times, but now, even after he just gets out of prison, he stands before all of these religious leaders again, and a large crowd, he tells them all to repent, they're responsible for crucifying Jesus in whose name all people must be saved. And here's the amazing explanation that you find in the text. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had what? Been with Jesus. So do you see that? You have to be with Jesus. And see, the more you're immersed in sports or your work or politics or a hobby or whatever it is, the more you can speak clearly about it. And in the same way, the more you spend time with Jesus, the more you can speak clearly and boldly about him. And how are we to be with Jesus? Daniel insisted on it through prayer three times a day. And for us today, if you put a number of texts together throughout Scripture, it would include fellowship and being with Jesus will involve a rhythm of Bible reading, prayer, courageous steps forward, talking to Christian friends, corporate worship, participating in the life of the church. And through all of this, here's what we are doing. What we do through all of that is we treat God as God and as a God who's present. And all of this is to say that our boldness and courage is possible only as we relentlessly submit ourselves to receive it from our Lord and Savior. E.M. Bounds, in one of his books on prayer, tells this story about a friend of his. He said, rising early one morning, he said, I heard the barking of a number of dogs chasing a deer. Looking at a large open field in front of me, I saw a young fawn making its way across the field and giving signs that its race was almost run. 
It leaped over the rails of the enclosed place and crouched within 10 feet of where I stood. A moment later, two of the hounds came over and the fawn ran in my direction and pushed its head between my legs. I lifted the little thing to my breast and swinging round and round, I fought off the dogs. Just then I felt that all the dogs in the West could not and would not capture that fawn after its weakness had appealed to my strength. And in the same way, when you bend down with your weakness before Almighty God and you nuzzle your head into him with prayer, God will move powerfully to protect and care for you. The psalmist in 138, he said, In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. So when you in your weakness appeal to the infinite strength of God, he will take you into his arms and perfectly provide. A second way to be radically courageous is to have this confidence in God's sovereign care. Daniel's peers and subordinates, the other two governors, the 120 satraps, they were all envious of him. They hated him because he wasn't one of them, and it appeared that he was going to take away some of their power. And so this is why they schemed to convince the king to sign a law that would work against Daniel's convictions. The situation looked very grim. There would be no one to appeal to. It would be execution by the lion's teeth tearing away at, their, at his flesh. It's the only option unless there's some supreme confidence in God. Verse 10 through 11, when he went home and disobeyed the new law, he did so because he's confident that God is in control of the situation. He had no other plan. Lord, I need you to supply me with all of my need. And in verse 22, he says, my God sent his angel and he shut the lion's mouths. So what we see here is that when you lean on God, you get the power of God and when you get the power of God, you can change the world rather than have the world change you. Through my years of ministry, and one of the greatest dangers, one of the greatest sins for me, still, is a sin of self-dependence. Anybody have any of that going on? Yeah, yeah, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. Probably that'll be next week. All right? And, and what hurts that is that I'm often healthy, strong. God has given me a number of gifts, talents. I can study fairly well. I can speak uh, uh, somewhat well. I can swing a hammer, right? And I can, I can play some sports and on and on. And who needs God when you have all these good things going on? And one problem with this self-dependence is that if my success is dependent on me, I'm not inclined to attempt great things and thus will seldom rise above mediocrity. Because by myself, I have very limited confidence or power to accomplish much. Leaning on myself, I retreat in the face of opposition or opportunity rather than boldly stepping out with confidence in God's perfect provision. We will always have greater influence in our marriage, in our family, in our community, and beyond if we will act with confidence in God's great power and control over all things. And now before we move on, let's think about what courage could look like for us. I just come up with a few examples. It could be standing up strong and rejecting someone's assertion that is contrary to God's word. If you remember the story of John the Baptist denouncing Herod for taking his brother's wife. And sometimes we do need to stand firm in the face of increasing pressure to conform to the godless trajectory in our culture with politics, morality, human sexuality, and the list goes on and on. But we're also not called to participate in every argument that's going on around us. 
Courage could also involve opening your heart, your life, and your home to strangers and building a new friendship. It's a matter of everyday faithfulness with hospitality. And listen to me now. Courage could mean as well telling the truth to a friend or a family member. Proverbs 27, he said, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. So one way to think about it is this. Friends don't let friends live with sin. Spouses don't do that either. Sometimes we need to be bold and speak. A mealy-mouthed wimp will bury their love under a pile of insecurity and peace-faking. Or think about this. Cancer does not go away by ignoring it. Sometimes you have to go through painful treatment. And in the same way, a courageous friend will speak truth and deal with matters even at the risk of a painful mess. Or here's another way to see it. Courage will involve taking the hard road of loving well through sacrificial service. And so that may involve serving and laying yourself down for your spouse or your children or your parents or a family member or a neighbor, even when they're cold, difficult, or unresponsive. That's courage. Radical courage is the path that Jesus has taken for you. And radical courage will make you faithful in whatever place and position God has given you. So now here's finally the third way to be radically courageous, and that is through integrity. Integrity means that you're the same on the outside as you are on the inside. You're solid to the core. There's no acting. There's no pretense. If you look at our story, there's this, it's amazing how many times it's repeated about Daniel's integrity. He's a distinguished and faithful ruler, verses 2 through 3. In verse 4, no error or fault can be found in him. Verse 14, the king tried to save Daniel because he likely knew he had been tricked by the conspirators. Verse 22, he was found innocent before God and the king. Daniel could be bold against these men because he had nothing to hide. They had nothing over him. Daniel could be bold against the king's crazy law because he was rightly choosing to obey God rather than men. So think about this. What would have happened if Daniel was not so faithful? What if he had been skimming a bit of the receipts and the taxes that he collected and kept them for himself. His detractors would find that out, make legitimate accusations, and get rid of him. And how often do we see that today, that kind of corruption in business or in our government and politics today? Or consider this, if Daniel had not been honest in some areas, even if no one else would not know about it, how would that impact his confidence in going to God for his salvation? He would be very hesitant to approach God if he had this guilt that's hanging around his neck. And in a similar way, you are capable of bold obedience if you are a man or woman of integrity. On the other hand, if you lead a double life, you're going to be a wimp for God. And if you're hiding some sin or coldness in your life, you will always be in the bleachers. Sometimes with your arms crossed, sometimes envious of those who are alive and well. And so 
if you do some cheating on tests or papers or taxes or dabbling in pornography or, or you're, 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 doing some, you're telling some lies or gossip or complaining or being cheap in your giving to God, it will all work to turn you into a wimp for God. But let's take this a little bit further. The reality is, and now you're not going to want to hear this, all of us struggle with living a double life and being wimps for God and retreating from his will for us. And so how can we make the transition to the bold obedience which comes from fellowship with God, confidence in God, and integrity? I could simply tell you, go and be like Daniel, but you will fail miserably. And then you're going to wonder what happened. It's not working out like, like I thought it would. And there's a number of you here this morning who struggle as Christians or you're not even Christians yet because somehow you uh, have understood this familiar story through the years. God shut the mouth. You've understood it this way. God shut the mouths of the lions and you're good. If you're good and you trust like Daniel, God will take care of you too. And then here's what happened for some of you. There have been times when you're not so sure that God did take care of you. And so some of you became disillusioned, perhaps even rejected God. So think about this story. There was a man who was stirring up trouble among the religious leaders of his day. They saw him as a threat to the power and the prestige that they had all worked so hard for. They envied, hated him so much that they vowed to somehow get him killed. They were unable to find any legitimate charges against him. He was blameless, innocent, faithful, without charge or fault. And so these leaders conspired together, worked out a plan. They found him in his customary place, a garden, intensely laboring in prayer. He's arrested, and the leaders manipulated the higher authorities to execute him all the while confessing they had no king but Caesar. And then they see that Jesus, who is the true Daniel, claimed and used the words of Psalm 22 to describe someone who had perfect integrity, and yet this was his experience and his cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in this same psalm, verse, four, verse 13, the accusing and the mocking words are described with this image, they open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. The higher authorities could find no fault in him, and they worked hard to free him, but they were reminded that the law forbid it, and so Jesus was led to his execution. And Jesus, the true Daniel, cried out and was rejected by God so that when we cry out, we will never be rejected. And Jesus allowed himself to be taken to the real lion's den, not at the risk of his life, but at the cost of his life. And unlike Daniel, Jesus suffered an anguishing death, and there was clear evidence of his severe injuries. And he trusted God to deliver him as a stone was rolled over his tomb and sealed. And then most amazingly in this story, just as we celebrated last week, very early at sunrise as well, he was discovered to be alive after this terrible death. And this death and resurrection led to God's raising up Jesus to the position of king of kings, the judge of all mankind. And he gained the position and the power to have his enemies pay a terrible price for their hatred, compel his people, you and me, to worship him with trembling and fear. And here's what we need to understand. Most of us know that we are to be in the world and not of it. And you know that you are to be holy and radically different. 
And you know that we're called to pray and to trust God and have integrity. You also might have these hidden or these nagging sins or you have this heart that gets calloused and cold. And so with all this stuff going on, how can you, again, be courageously different? Well, you need Jesus to empower you for bold love and obedience. And do you know what Daniel means? It means God is my judge. And if God is my judge, what that means then is you're not. And I don't care what anybody else thinks. And that's huge for every one of us. There's an old hymn that goes like this. That's one stanza. It says, let's, let's read it together. It's great, all right? Well may the accuser war of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. Jehovah knoweth none. That's yours. When you go to the Father with humility and repentance, so do you believe that the true Daniel went into the ultimate lion's den for you? We see it in Daniel's story and the decree of King Darius. Our God, he says, is a rescuer. He's a savior. And the question is, is God your rescuer and savior? Do you believe that Jesus took your punishment so that you are really innocent before God? Because then you can be bold. You can accuse me and roar all you want. Jesus was killed by the only lions that can truly kill me. C.S. Lewis wrote that you will never tame the lions in your life unless you let God be the untamed lion in your life. And so, in other words, you will shrink with fear until you fear God and are in awe of what he has done. So we can make a difference in our community. We can be bold. We can be truly different. Let us fear and be in awe of God so that we will fear nothing else. Let's pray together. Holy Father, you're amazing in your provision for us. You never call us to do anything that you haven't done, that you haven't empowered us to do. And we pray, Lord, that we would follow the path of Jesus with the power of Jesus, with the presence of Jesus. And we would be radically courageous and different. We would love as we are loved we would be indeed those who live without fear. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.